Day 37, Proud Boys trial. We're checking in with Roger Parloff. He is the individual there live tweeting away, and he writes, We're back. Today, we finish the Agent Nicole Miller testimony, and hopefully we reach the penultimate witness, Agent Peter Dubrowski, who is another FBI agent who might be on his second tour. So he says, and Roger wrote a great synopsis on this, sort of catching us up, so I do want to spend a little bit of time on it. He says, that yesterday, the defense attempts to undermine Agent Nicole Miller, FBI Nicole, so far failed. And we read through all of that. There were some pretty shocking revelations there with her hidden spreadsheet rows, with the fact that she was asked to delete 338 pieces of evidence, with the idea that it was perfectly acceptable to listen in on attorney-client privilege conversations because they clicked a box on it all sorts of insane things. We thought that her credibility was going to be devastated. Unfortunately for the defense, the judge kept most of that out, just said, not, not relevant. There's no evidence that they did anything nefarious and move forward. Don't even speak about it again. Essentially, he sat several of them down when they were trying to even make their record. It was quite shocking, but their attempts instead, they weren't able to do that to use her as their own witness has borne some fruit. So what they're trying to do is use her to just change the narrative. And we saw that a lot yesterday. The cross by attorney Nick Smith, who's representing Nordine, suggested that the march may have been more haphazard than the government portrayed. They said that the, that the Proud Boys were just, as soon as Trump was done, they said, boom, raiding the Capitol, storming the Capitol now. But obviously that's not exactly how it went down. Instead, they said that what the government depicted was that they made a beeline from the Washington Monument to the Capitol, where they cased the joint. But Smith showed multiple videos, and that pushed back on that. It says that it shows that it was more haphazard, and Nordine is going to be the first witness coming up on Monday. And so let's just go right into the, he's giving us a brief recap here. But now Judge Kelly is back on the bench, and so let's start right here. Roger Parloff, he continues. Judge Kelly is now back on the bench, day 37. He says that over the evening, he says the judge received objections from Smith and Nordeen and Carmen Hernandez, those two lawyers we just talked about. They say the government wants to introduce exhibits through their next witness. It's going to be FBI agent Peter Dubrowski. He testified earlier. They're going to bring him back. So the judge says, OK, well, what do you guys want to argue about? What are you talking about? So attorney for the defense, Smith, stands up and he says, all right, well, judge, you know, they introduced this document as exhibits. And you see this exhibit, it says from Rufio, everyone needs to just shut the F up. And Rufio, and there's all these, there's a conversation here happening. But the defense got this and they said, well, I want to know what was said before this. What was the first message before that one came out? He said that there is another message, one right above that. And it says something of the effect, it references that Biggs is a steaming pile of dog doo-doo uh-oh, that makes it sound like the Capitol attack was planned. Okay, so do you see what's happening here? So in this line of conversation, there's one message where one proud boy is saying to another, rail posted. And he's calling another proud boy. So one co-defendant is calling another co-defendant a steaming pile of dog S, right? that makes it sound like the capital attack was planned. So the defense wants to get that in because if it makes it sound like the capital attack was planned, obviously it wasn't planned, right? He's making it sound like we intended to do that, implying that we obviously didn't intend to do that. So what the defense wants is they want to add that in. They want to go back to this exhibit and they say, hey, you know, we need that in there because that is going to be a complete, that's going to be the complete message. It's going to provide context. So the defense attorney says, yeah, I want it included. But the prosecutor came out and he said, sorry, judge, the exhibit's already in evidence. We talked about that yesterday. It's already those four messages. And when we got it admitted into evidence, nobody made an objection about that. He didn't, he didn't, he should have raised it when we were talking about it yesterday. He says, but even if that's a side, I don't think that the portion that we wanted to include has anything to do with anything. He says, he says, Nordeen wants people to shut the F up because people are getting arrested, not because it has anything to do with the intentions with the Capitol. The statement that Smith wants in, they say, is self-serving hearsay. Actually, that was Connor Monroe, not Kinnearson. 
So the judge is sitting there, he's mulling this over, and we're asking this one message that calls Biggs a steaming pile of DS because he made it, he implied that this was a planned thing. Judge is going, ah, gosh, I don't know. Should I allow that message in? Steaming pile message? He's thinking about it. So now the judge says, you know what? I am going to allow it. Oh, that's good. So I am going to allow the additional statement in. So the jurors can see that. So this, this document will get one additional line up here and it'll say Biggs is a steaming pile of DS and we essentially implying we didn't plan to attack the Capitol, which is good news for them because that's what they want the jurors to see. Fighting amongst the co-defendants. You want to show that there's no conspiracy here because they, they didn't agree on anything. And it wasn't planned. And this is all just made up. So that's a good win for the defense. Now, the judge is allowing that. So Smith, the defense, he's like, oh, perfect, baby. Let's open these floodgates. I got something in. Let's see what else I can get in. So he says, okay, judge. Well, I have another one here, right? They submitted this, but it's incomplete. He said that Nordine said something in another message. And Nordine is this individual here, just so we're keeping tabs on who is who. Ethan Nordine is one of the first co-defendants or the first co-defendant. Apparently he said, F Trump, F him more than Biden, right? So he's mad because of something that happened there. So Smith now wants to include an earlier message from Nordine that again, calls an FBI affidavit against Biggs, a steaming pile of DS. So the prosecutor comes in and he says, okay, Oh, well, if you want to include that message, which is all the way up here, then I want to include all of the other messages that are in between. There are 10 messages between the ones that we introduced yesterday and the one Smith wants to introduce. And so if he introduces that, we're getting everything in between. And the prosecutor says, I mean, if that one comes in, they all got to come in. And in that sequence, apparently is a pretty problematic message. Apparently there's a proud boy called AJ Fisher and Smith has claimed Nordine doesn't know. So that's been his strategy, right? Nordine doesn't know this guy. But there is a message about a videographer calling in Mulrow's words an effing C word. And we should have left him stuck in the mud, which is a you know not a good statement. Block is in a wheelchair, you know. So meaning if you put a wheelchair in the mud, it's not going to be very good for the person in the wheelchair. So that, that, that's a bad message. In other words, you don't want that message going in front of the jury that you want to acquit your client. Doesn't look good. If your client's sitting there talking about sticking people in wheelchairs in the mud. So Mulrow says it shows consciousness of guilt. The prosecutor's like, yeah, we got to get this in here. He obviously knows him. He's obviously wanting him stuck in the mud. And so the, he says, I got to get it all in. If, he's, if, he, if that one comes in, everything's coming in. So judge is sitting here and goes, okay, gosh, you guys are giving me a headache. He says, all right, look, I'm going to keep out the message that Smith wanted to include. It's too remote from the portion the government is offering, right? So it's too far up. And that was the message about, so it's hard to keep track of what the different messages are, but you can see we're debating about what they are. So then they discuss another photo that was altered on Parler. Nordeen posted it on Parler. Apparently, it shows a U.S. Capitol Police officer grinning as he sprays an older man with pepper spray. The officer wasn't grinning. And so Smith objects that there's no evidence that Nordeen doctored the photo or knew that it was altered. So they, they went over to Nordeen's Parler account. He posted this here. And he doesn't want that in here. But the government says, well, I, we don't think it matters if Nordine altered it. Says the government hasn't been able to find the altered photo anywhere else via a Google search. And Smith says the defense, well, if Nordine didn't manipulate it, then it's not relevant. Judge says, yeah, but he did post it. And so you can raise that on cross that they can't prove that Nordine altered it, right? So we're, we're having a lot of debates about evidence that's going to be coming in throughout the rest of the trial. The judge says, does the government think that it has independent value to your case? That this manipulated photo has value even if he didn't manipulate it himself? 
Yeah, they say, yeah, the fact that the top leader of this group is posting altered photos to make the police look bad means that there's a strong inference that he or one of his colleagues did the manipulation. Okay, so essentially they're implying that these guys have a propaganda arm. They've got this meme factory and they're generating these memes of Capitol Hill police officers spraying old men in the face, jerks, with pepper spray. And they're posting that and they're saying, yeah, he's the leader of the group. So it just shows that he's trying to rally people up. He's the top leader of the group. He's posting altered memes to, to rally and make the police look bad. So there's an inference that one of them manipulated it. Nordine says, well, there's no evidence of that. It's just an image that came off the internet. So we can't say that he manipulated it or that he was you know, launching this propaganda effort. Judge says, well, I'm going to rule it in. That evidence can, comes in, can come in. So, you know, now you've got this, this parlor post is in and the defense doesn't want that at all. So Carmen Hernandez representing Zachary real says, judge, I object on this. It's totally irrelevant. What's the issue manipulating this photo after the fact It has nothing to do with any of the allegations in the indictment that we just read. The judge says, well, some defendants have suggested here that the police did not do their jobs properly. I think there's some relevance. So he lets it in. Saying that they, I guess, uh, I guess it's amazing. I guess allowing the government the opportunity to, pro It's just a meme, essentially. It's just a meme. And they're turning it into this motive of criminality and conspiracy. It's pretty amazing. Now, here's another one. So the Department of Justice, Mulrow, the government prosecutor, tries to get this other thing in. It's, a, it's about a reaction from the group after January 6th. Nordine, they have a video of him. He's saying something like, this is effing disgusting. I'm pissed right now. F Trump. And there's these two kind of categories of regret. Defendants, there's two types of regrets. One, that they didn't go far enough on January 6th. And two, that they got hung out to dry by Donald Trump after they felt that they'd been acting on his behalf. So this and the other messages show Nordeen expressing that second half, saying we got hung out to dry by Trump. This was posted on January 20th, right after Biden took office. They're still com communicating. In fact, Nordeen makes reference to the pardon power and said that Trump pardoned a bunch of degenerates but left out the Proud Boys and they're all facing jail time. They thought that they took on, for, for actions they thought they took on his behalf, which is all true. Trump did that. He could have pardoned a bunch of people and he didn't. So the judge says, you know what? Those messages can come in. I'm gonna allow those in too. So all of the Trump bashing, bashing messages are coming in. Now, there's another series of videos. We haven't even gotten to testimony yet. It says, now there's a series of post-J6 selfies that Nordeen took of himself when he was drunk. So after January 6th, these guys are drinking. They're posting and sharing messages. They're all on Telegram. And the government wants those selfies in as evidence. He's drunk. He's ranting on Telegram. Smith, the defense, is saying, what are you talking about? They're after January 6th. He's drunk. He's ranting about other things. They have nothing at, at whatsoever to do with January 6th. So why would we let those in? And the prosecutor says, well, towards the end of one of those videos, they say something about having stormed the Capitol. That's why. And the judge says, you know, for the life of me, I don't see how the first video has anything to do with the second video. What are you trying to get this in for, Mr. Prosecutor? Tell me what you're thinking. And he says, well, these two things, they provide context, judge. It's all about context. What he's talking about with this woman is about what he puts importance on. He goes on, he's talking about Nordine. He says that he explains what, what's important is that he took part in storming the Capitol. You know, he's talking to this babe. He's like, hey, sweetie, look, I'm, you know, I, I stormed the Capitol. Then he talks about our reality and how it's so different from anyone else's. And they say, well, it provides context for the other clips. And he says, well, okay, well, the first video's out, right? Context is out, but the other two are in. So it's hard, again, it's hard to tease out which videos are which, but one is in 
one is out and the other two are in. So presumably, again, there are more videos of Ethan Nordine being drunk. Now there's another video. He's still drunk, I think. And he's mocking Trump. He's mocking Trump. He said, we're a nation of laws. I condemned what happened. He said, yes. Judge admits that one too. Says he's responding to the fact that they feel abandoned. And so that is coming in. Then they turned their attention over to another exhibit. Judge Kelly had already excluded this one. It's a message from 2020. Another Proud Boy called Nick Ox, who's an elder in the Proud Boys. And he said there's a message in here somewhere that if the election challenges fail, that it's time for violence. So the prosecutor says, well, judge, when we sought to admit it back during our at first FBI agent Dubrowski's testimony, it was to show a mental state of Nick Ox, a co-conspirator. But now that we've seen the totality of the evidence and the video of Ox celebrating in there with Biggs and Nordine, two Proud Boys, we're offering it to provide important evidence of Tario's understanding and his role in J6. So they want additional messages to come in. Now, on Parler, Tario was asking followers to fund his Give, Send, Go. So uh, Nick Ock got arrested and Tario is posting you know, tweets to get him out of custody. Just like Kamala Harris did for the Summer of Love in 2020 when they torched Minneapolis. So she's not facing federal charges, though. She's not charged with any conspiracy for colluding with those protesters, no. But here, Tario is. Tario posted free Nick, and that's illegal. So they're saying that they held Ox out as a bona fide journalist. And Judge Kelly is now taking this one under advisement, but he sounds skeptical, so that may not be coming in. And so Carmen Hernandez stands up. She's speaking on behalf of Zachary Real. She's talking, and she's saying, Judge, this is ridiculous. Ob objection, I've objected to this, and you didn't allow this, and so on, and she's going off. And the judge says, hey, so many of your objections here, I've already ruled on this, okay? I've already ruled on it. And Hernandez says, oh yeah, well that's because, and so on, and she's speaking even more. She's blah, blah, judge, and I, I'm sure she's outraged. You know, she's making a record, it's all on transcript, and good for her. Shout out to Hernandez. But now, another defense attorney is now discussing the altered photo again. He says he's found other examples of it as being a part of a meme on the internet. It's just a meme. But that's okay, they still prosecute people for illegal memes. We've covered many of those illegal prosecutions for posting illegal memes here on this channel. And in fact, another individual is going through a trial on that very issue right now. So the judge says, listen, everybody, I'm not gonna burn any more time on this. This is fair game, scolding all of the defense attorneys. This is fair game. Photos coming in and you can cross-examine them if you want on this issue and you can present your own evidence on it during your own case. So all of that is coming in. Not great. So then they take a break. The judge says, all right, I'm tired of yelling at you guys. So we're coming back in 10 minutes and we get to fast forward through it. So now we're back on the bench. The jury is brought in and here's where we start. For, sub, uh, no, this is for, this is for Enrique Tario. So we know Enrique Tario here and his attorney is this guy, Sabino Jaraguay. So these are the two people we're listening to now testify or, or the attorney is cross-examining FBI agent Nicole Miller. So Sabino takes the podium and resumes his cross-examination of FBI agent Nicole. The defense. Uh, agent Nicole... I want to draw your attention to this exhibit over here, 509. You see that there on the screen? Yeah. Can you tell me why does this first entry right here that I'm highlighting for you, why is that message blank at 12.01.55 a.m.? You see that? It says Enrique, Florida, proud boy. What's going on there? She says, well, the FBI never recovered that message. Okay, well, that's interesting. And this is from the Ministry of Self-Defense chat. Yeah. So do you know if he's actually in this MOSD chat? Is he even in there? I mean, did you get any messages from him? And she says, well, yeah, there, there is an entry from later. It's around 8 a.m. where Tario seems like he's participating. But you have no idea why those messages, like I just showed you, why those are blank, right? That's correct. 
Okay, Agent Nicole, and have you impounded the phone of a proud boy from Hawaii called Nick Ox? Says the FBI did, yeah. And you got these phones together to piece together these chats, right? And that's why you needed the cell phones. He says, well, I don't have in-depth knowledge of telegram extractions. Kate Kane, she's another FBI agent. She's got more knowledge about that than I do. Okay, agent, but the reason that you thought Tario had some part in editing the document of the 1776 returns document, that was a Google search? Is that why you thought he wrote that? She says it was a variety of things. Google was one of them. But you weren't sure when he conducted the Google search? Uh, I actually am. She says it was on January 1st, 2021. So the defense says, well, that's interesting. I'm going to show you this document here. Maybe this will help refresh your recollection. Can you tell me what you're looking at here? She says, well, this is not what I looked at, but it does show the same date and time. She says, I looked at it in Cellbrite. She says, okay, well, this is very similar to that or whatever he's showing her. I don't know. He says, in that report, there was one search for Winter Palace on 1-1, wasn't there? And Winter Palace was a doc was a, a term referenced in the document, the 1776 document. She says, yes, that was a search term. That was passed out. And asks another question. Were there people screaming 1776 at the Capitol on January 6th? She says, yeah, they were. And that's a phrase that's used in other rallies, right? Besides just being at the Capitol. Well, I can't speak for other rallies. Are you aware that Winter Palace was also a frequent rallying cry at demonstrations around that time? She says, no, uh, not to my knowledge. All right, well, I want to turn your attention and go back to another area. I want to know, Agent Nicole, have you ever used gun charges to pressure people to cooperate? Like, Bertino, another proud boy. Before you interviewed Bertino, you had access to both Tario's and Rail's phone. She says, I had access to Zach's phone and I had brief access to Enrique Tario's phone. How many times did you meet with Bertino? And remember, Bertino is one of the proud boys that was turned by the FBI. And they got, they got him sat down. They said, Enrique Tario's a liar. He did this thing that you didn't think he did. And Bertino says, wow, you're kidding me. I thought I was a, uh, what? I thought these were my bros. And they said, no. And they also said, by the way, we've got gun charges that we could file against you. You better help us. And he said, okay, well, I guess I've been betrayed. Turns out they weren't, he wasn't really betrayed because they lied about Enrique Tario's involvement in the document. So how many times did you meet with Bertino before you guys turned him? Three or four. And you hope that once you conducted a search of the home, that you'd get him to cooperate, right? Because apparently he's got maybe a felony conviction or something. Once they could search and find something illegal, they could threaten him with other charges. You see how this works? You get a warrant because of J6. They find illegal guns in there because he's a prohibited possessor. Boom, new charges. Oh, well, we'll save you these new charges if you cooperate with us on this one, right? Take this plea deal. We won't file this new set of filings. Now, they said that when you got the search warrant that you, you sort of hoped you'd get him to cooperate. She says, well, we hoped he would cooperate, but it had nothing to do with the search. Yeah, right. Did you want to get him real badly? Objection. You know, overruled. Yes, we wanted him to cooperate. Did you even use the words in your report that I really want him arrested? Exclamation point in your chats. Did you ever say that? I really want him arrested. She says, ah, oh, possibly I could have said that. Okay, agent, is it fair to say that when you couldn't get him to cooperate, did you ever write something like along the lines of, we didn't push him hard enough? Was that in your messages? She says, possibly it could have been. Did you ever think, Agent Nicole, if we get nothing else, we'll get him on those gun charges? Nothing else will get him on the gun charges. You ever think that? Possibly. Agent, did you ever say that we'll use those gun charges to get him to cooperate? Did you ever say that? Possibly. Did you ever say something like, hoping he has a change of mind and decide he wants to talk because we're threatening him with new charges, totally unrelated to January 6th? 
because all they're trying to do is make their case. They need seditious conspirators to turn this thing, this giant fake charade into something more legitimate. They need seditious conspiracy charges. And so they're pressuring the Proud Boys with gun charges that are not even related to J6. And they've got their messages saying, you hope he changes your mind now that you're about to prosecute him, right? You said something like, sounds good, fingers crossed, want to get this guy so badly. Isn't that what you were saying, Agent Nicole Miller from the FBI? These people are weird, man. This is what they're texting back and forth. So another question comes up, don't know what it is, objection sustained. And Bertino, when you sat down with him and you stole his phone from him, was that helpful too? Yes, it was. I'm sure it was. Now, did you ever say something like, we weren't pushing hard last time, but next time we have so much to use? Objection sustained. Couldn't get into that. Don't know why. Now, did you try to get a third shot at interviewing? I don't know. What do you mean by that? Third shot? What do you mean? Well, you had been pushing to for the DNA for the guns, right? Well, I don't know that I was. I mean, that was done through the FBI Charlotte out of North Carolina. Prosecutor stands up and says, Judge, I object to this. None of this is proper because he is only allowed to cross-examine her with inconsistent statements, and these are consistent with her testimony. So the judge says, all right, sidebar, get on the phones. So they get on the phones. They get back off the phones. Defense starts back up. He says, all right, FBI agent, were you able to acquire a, a video of Bertino who flipped on the Proud Boys shooting a gun? Yeah, we got one. And that was more ammunition to get him to flip, objection sustained, right? So they got a video and I don't know what the objection was, but maybe, okay. So it was, yeah, they're just gobbling up evidence of the weapons charges. And you did that to pressure him to flip, objection sustained. Are there voice notes by Enrique Tario that you're aware of on J6? She says, well, not specifically on January 6th that I can think of. Uh, uh, at what time, FBI Nicole, approximately, you know, give or take, did defendants in this case enter the Capitol? Objection, compound, question. Please rephrase. Okay, what time did they first enter in this case? 2.13 p.m. And what time was the last Proud Boy out of the Capitol building? She says, well, I know last off Capitol grounds, the last person that exited the building was 3.13 p.m. First entered at 2.13, around 3.13, they were already gone. They've been in custody ever since, basically, ever since they were arrested for less than one hour in there. Now, pretty small. We know that they were back and counting votes that night. They were The building was declared secure by 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. They were already bringing Congress people back by 7.13 that night, or about 7.15 declared secured. They counted the votes that night. It was over, which was strange for something that almost interfered with American democracy. Thought it might take something a little bit more than that, but uh, I'm not a Democrat, so I don't know how to be hyperbolic and hyperventilate over every little thing. So this continues now. He says, I want to turn our attention over to Kenny Lazardo. Here, Kenny Lazardo, who we learned about yesterday, was a confidential human source. Kenny Lazardo was a confidential human source who yesterday went and picked up Enrique Tario and brought him back to his hotel in Baltimore on January 5th, I believe it was. So the FBI had feds embedded all over the place, not actual, you know, employed feds, but confidential human sources picking up the Proud Boys. Kenny Lazardo, he's also a part of the boots on the ground chat. Is that right, agent? Yeah. He's also part of the MOSD, the ops chat. Yeah. He's also part of the noble MOSD vetting chat. Yeah. He's also a part of the street sweepers chat. Yeah. And he had personal texts with Tario. Yeah. And you had conversations with Lazardo personally. Yes. And he was in rallies in November and December. And that entire time he was providing info to the FBI. Yeah. And he wasn't able to give you any evidence whatsoever in gets against Enrique, my client, was he?
Objection sustained. So, Agent FBI, Nicole, you just pieced together parlor and telegram evidence against my client, didn't you? She says, no, 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 that's not it. We have much more than that. This was a vast investigation involving multiple people. And she's, you know, that same uh, talking point that they program into all of the DOJ individuals. Now everybody works over there. I think they have chips in their brain or something. They just insert it and they say, insurrection, 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 insurrection. And so she goes through that big, you know, almost like a chat GPT pre-recorded statement. So they, all right, enough of that. Lizardo, he picked up Tario from jail on January 5th. Is that right? So one of your confidential human sources went and picked up Enrique Tario from jail on January 5th. Is that right? Yes. And drove around with him all day, right? Yes. And Tario conducted multiple interviews on January 5th with the media, didn't he? Yes. Any interviews from Tario on January 6th? Possibly, but I can't think of any. Well, how about Nick Kested? interviewed Tario on J6. Do you remember that? She says, well, I think it was that evening, I think. He says, no further questions. They say, thank you, Mr. Jaraguay. Who's next? So we turn our attention over to Pozzola's lawyer, and Pozzola is now represented by Stephen Allen Metcalf, this gentleman here, New York criminal defense attorney, on behalf of Dominic Pozzola. Here's where the questioning starts. Defense, Metcalf, stands up. All right, FBI agent Nicole. Now, you've been investigating Pozzola, my client, since the beginning, haven't you? Yes. And you started on January 6th? She says, well, I uh, didn't start with the Proud Boys initially. Specifically, I was involved with the Proud Boys in about March of 2021 when they decided they needed a conspiracy charge. And then the, the defense asks another question. So, okay, when you got assigned the Proud Boys case in March 2021, when about did you start knowing and investigating my client, Pozzola? She says, well, when I got over to the New York field office, later on, I caught him up maybe in March, caught on to him, maybe March. So you only focused on New York chapters? She says, well, some individuals played into this, and yes. And how about Matt Green? She says, well, Green's case was out of Albany, and I worked with an Albany agent then. Same with Pozzola? Yeah. But the green case agent was Wren, and Pozzola's case was Kevin Butter or something. So they're talking about who's in charge of the cases. And the defense says, okay, so throughout 2021, were you investigating anything else, or were you just investigating the Proud Boys? She says, "Um, it was an investigation not into the Proud Boys. It was just into January 6th. I mean, some Proud Boys were involved in that, but it was a bigger investigation. So who did you look into who weren't Proud Boys? I mean, if you weren't looking only at the Proud Boys, there's this other category of people. Who were they? She says, well, there were other people I worked on, somebody named Shannon, somebody named Trevor McDonald. Okay, and how many targets did you have that were not Proud Boys, like Shannon and like Trevor? She says, what do you mean by target? Well, you label people, right, as witnesses, you know, someone with info, a CHS word or something like that. I mean, she says, well, I don't use that word. Not something I've ever come across at the FBI. I don't call anybody witnesses. So you're working with, and uh, he must've just left that one. So you're working with five lead case agents. She says, well, they're all agents except Dubrowski are Washington field office agents. So she's being difficult now, right? She's, she's playing word games with him. You labeled people as witness, like someone with info. I don't know what you're talking about. I never called anybody anything. You got five case agents working on this. No, they're agents except Dubrowski, right? She's getting tired of, of these defense attorneys. So Metcalf then says, all right, so you guys met in person. You sent emails back and forth. You have emails that talk about classification designations. And these emails, you have these emails that you sent her back and forth between your team. They're either categorized as classified or unclassified, right? You've got these three different types of emails that you send, classified, unclassified, FOIO, which is for official use only. And then, and, and then there's secret too? And she says, yeah, we got all those categories. And do you guys use a system to communicate these messages internally at the FBI? She says, yeah, yeah, we use a system. It's called Link. And you had access to that? Yes, I did. I had access. It's a classified system. So it's on the red side. The unclassified side is called the green side. What's SOF? Objection. Sidebar. Don't know what that is. 
comment inserted courtesy of Roger. He says the guiltier a lawyer's client is, the more time the lawyer will spend on exploring matters totally divorced from the evidence. So he goes back. Yeah, I guess he's thinking that Pizzola is the most guilty. And maybe of the criminal damage charge. But again, a conspiracy charge I still think is a stretch. Anyways, Roger Parloff continues. He says that Metcalf says throughout this time, you were constantly finding new information when you were playing your Where's Waldo games at the Proud Boys, right? Yeah. And you familiarized yourself with these group chat group chats? Yes, I did. And you discussed these chats with your team, didn't you? Yes. And you knew that Pizzola was not a part of a lot of these chats, right? Yes. And so I want to show you what is here on the screen here. This is the, called the new MOSD chat. You see this here? Is this the new chat? Tell me about that one. Well, that's where all the new people went. And uh, on the screen is Aaron of the Bloody East and Noble Beard of Immortal and Yut Yut Cowabunga. But do you see Pozzola in that chat? No, I don't. Do you see him on any leadership chat? No. Here, I want to show you this one. Here is a, a image of the MOSD, the Ministry of Self-Defense chat, the main chat. And uh, this is on your screen here. Do you see that there, Agent Nicole? Yeah. You see my client, Enrique Tario, in any of those? Or I'm sorry, no, my client, Dominic Pozzola. Enrique Tario's right there. We've got Enrique Tario here, Noble Beard, a bunch of other people, but we don't have Dominic Pozzola in there. So that's interesting. So the earliest that he actually did join any of these chats was on January 4th, right? She says, yeah, that sounds accurate. Well, I want to show you a new exhibit. Is that your handwriting, Agent Nicole? Yes. So these are your notes about what you've testified to up here on the screen? Yeah. Uh, judge, I'd like to introduce these. Objection sustained. Doesn't want it in. Admitted as evidence. Can you describe, foundation, can you describe what's on the first page? Objection, sidebar. All right. They go back to the, to the podium. Metcalf goes back. All right. Each of those pages I showed you are your notes. When did you create that document? As I started studying for my testimony, going through videos and figuring out the timeline as when I started writing those. Well, when did you do that? That took me about a few months. When did you finish? Did you complete it? I don't remember. I mean, it was recently. Well, I want to talk about what's noted at 1257. Must be a, a note. That's the first time that you re refer to Pozzola specifically. Objection sustained. That's a timeline you put together from 10 a.m. to 1257 on J6. Is that right? Yes. A general timeline. Yes. It's based off a montage that we watched. Now, Parloff tells us that we're watching a bit of the government's first montage. Metcalf is eliciting that from 1115 to 1121 that she's not sure that she saw Pozzola in the march. So you're aware that he left the march for a period? Yeah, he wasn't even there? Yeah. And can you tell me when he left the, the march? Did you find out that Green and Pozzola left? Yes, I did. So the defense is now asking, When's the next time that we're going to see Pozzola in this montage? Is it shortly after 1257? Agent Nicole says, yeah, it might have been present when the Proud Boys move from the food trucks back over to the peace circle. And Metcalf is just showing more and more clips, right? He's just playing the video. And he's doing the same thing that we saw a lot of yesterday. Is my client here? He's not here either. Oh, that's weird. Okay, is he here? No. Oh, he's not there either. Which is interesting. Let's let it play for another five minutes. You, why don't you tell me when you see my client? Okay. And he's still not there and you just let it go. So now they're showing a government video of the street in front of the Capitol, 1154 to 1155. A Proud Boy, Boys March group goes by. Neither Pozzola nor Green are visible. We see the orange hat group toward the end of this video, mostly Proud Boys from Arizona. Shout out to Arizona. Uh, what are they doing here, Agent Nicole? She says, well, they're... Uh, they're going to get to food trucks at about 12.07. And they go back to the video. It's now 12.07. Do you see Pozzola in there? 
Nope, he's still not there. They fast forward all the way to 1223, still not there. Huh, so you didn't see my client in any of that footage. Interesting. All right, well, now I want to ask you about what you did with their bank accounts, with their phone records and their hotel receipts. And he's eliciting that from her, FBI agent Nicole, objection sustained. So he says, okay, we'll move on. Now I want to talk about a picture that you guys got at the FBI from Green's phone. It's up on the screen here. Do you recognize this? She says, yeah, it shows Pozzola. He's walking around uh, toward the Peace Monument. That's at about 12.50, three minutes before the first breach. And Pozzola is with a person, Agent Nicole says, his name is Art, Art Lashone. Was Art ever arrested? Objection relevant, sustained. Metcalf is bringing out now that her notes. He says, okay, so your notes are back on the screen and your notes say that Pozzola first appeared for the very first time at 1256. Is that right? And you knew Pozzola left for over an hour? She says, well, I don't know how long he was gone for, but they were both gone from anywhere from an hour. Objection sustained. So no videos. He's, he's the, the defense attorney's almost making a statement there, right? They were both gone from anywhere for an hour. And so it's not actually a question, objection sustained. So then he goes back into a question. So no videos show Pozzola or Green then from 1115 to 1255. You don't have eyes on them from that entire window, right? Correct. Gone. So they can't place them anywhere. No videos. Show them anywhere for that entire window. So then the defense says, all right, we're looking at your notes and I see that they've got all the different defendants listed here. How long was Pozzola in the building? 24 minutes, that's all. He enters at 2.13, leaves at 2.36 p.m. They put the video on the screen. You see him up there when he's in there for those 20 minutes? 24 minutes, there's Pozzola. And Metcalf turns to the FBI agent and he says, Pozzola's looking like a little lost puppy here, isn't he? And there's just silence in the courtroom. A little lost puppy? And Pozzola's sitting there at the defense table. He's like, what'd you say, punk? Puppy? And so the courtroom doesn't know what to do. So then he says, he's not talking to anybody, right? He's just standing there. Kind of looks like he's lost a little bit. She said, well, potentially. I mean, he could have been, but he did speak with this guy. He says, but he doesn't really seem like he has a purpose, does he? So then they put another video up there. Metcalf, again, is calling Pozzola a lost puppy dog. Yeah, how about this one? Doesn't he look like a lost puppy dog here to you? You see here in this video, what's he doing here? Is here, is Pozzola giving a shield back to a police officer here? Is that what he's doing? She says, well, I wouldn't characterize it that way, but the shield does end up back with the police. So I don't know what video they're talking about, but she doesn't want to say that he gave it back to the cops. He puts up another video on the screen. He says, well, this one looks like he's giving it right back to the police, right? She says, the shield is provided back to the police by Mr. Pozzola. She did not like that question. FBI agent Nicole it looks like Dominic here is helping this officer and giving him his shield back, isn't he? He's a very nice guy. And he doesn't, do you see this reversal of the phrase? It's not, it's, it's very passive language. The shield is provided back to the police by Mr. Pozzola. Rather than saying Mr. Pozzola gave the shield to the police, the shield, this inanimate object, is provided back, mirac miraculously. Magically, you know, so uh, that's, that's some good government training right there. Now, everyone is taking a break for lunch in a short minute after that phrase. He enters the same place he entered from, right? Exits the same place he entered from 24 minutes later, right? She says yes. And now everyone is breaking for lunch until 1.30. So they all pile back into the courtroom. Now, Judge Kelly is back on the bench. One juror has an important medical appointment on Tuesday next week, so the jury will not be sitting then. So we're not going to have trial on Tuesday. Now, the judge was also thinking this over while he was eating his tuna, and he made his mind up on a few things. He says, all right, everybody, guess what? I am excluding one sentence 
from an exhibit the government wanted to introduce. Don't know what that is, but he's, ex he's excluding it. He's also ruling that someone in the boots on the ground chat saying we are now dom domestic terrorists is admissible, which is great. Not so I say that sarcastically, not so great for the defense. So the jurors are going to read that. Now, it's obviously a sarcastic statement. Smith interrupts. He's the defense attorney. He says, judge, how can you possibly rule on that? You had lunch and this is what you decided? The judge said, listen, when coupled with other statements there that are in the record, like don't post any video, they are looking for us. He says, it's clearly relevant. He says, but judge, it's so prejudicial against my client. It's a legal label calling them a domestic terrorist. Why don't you call them insurrectionists? Why don't you just say, why don't you just include a, a paragraph that says that we're, you know, insurrectionists or something like that, right? It's so prejudicial. You got to keep it out. He says, it's also inaccurate. He says, well, I already heard this argument this morning. Why are you bringing it up again? Sit down. And Carmen Hernandez, representing Real, stands up and says, Judge, can I be heard on this? So she stands up, and now she's arguing too. And we don't know what she's saying, but I'm sure it's extremely good. And then she's done, and he shuts her down. He's like, I already told you the same thing, Carmen, so why don't you sit down too? And then Norm stands up. He's for Joe Biggs. And he's like, Judge, okay, well, I have to speak up about this. I'm also objecting to that appellation. This is ridiculous. All these defense attorneys are pounding the table. And the prosecutor who's been getting his way this entire trial, attorney Mulroe, he says, oh, gosh, judge, these defense attorneys are so difficult here. Says we are burning so much of the jury's time relitigating things that your honor has already ruled on brown nosing Mulroe, typical. I agree with you, judge. You're doing a great job up there. And I think that you have already decided this. And I hope you had a great lunch. And thanks for being here. You're just doing a swell job. And the judge says, I agree with you. That's a great point, DOJ attorney. You guys are so smart. I, was, I, I miss working there with you guys. I agree. This is in. So it all comes in. <laughs> it's just like... Okay, what are you doing? Three attorney, three defense attorneys screaming from the rooftops and says, eh, well, whatever. So now the judge is turning to the government's request this morning to reconsider a piece of evidence that was already excluded some months ago. They say that there's new evidence, but he's sticking to his earlier ruling. Now, this is related to that Nick Ox exhibit this morning. And Carmen Hernandez, Hernandez is now re-arguing a different issue. She's fired up and he shuts her probably down again, too. They bring the jury back in. Now, attorney Metcalf is back. He is cross-examining FBI agent Nicole. He says, okay, Nicole. Now, my client, Pozzola, he left the march somewhere around 11.15 to 12.50. And there's this video on the screen here of Pozzola, and he's moving forward from the peace circle towards where the second breach occurs. You see that? Yeah, I follow. And you also see that Pozzola and this person called Green, they arrive at the peace circle right about the same time as the rest of the Proud Boys marching group does. You see that there? Yes, I do. And when you're watching that, my client, Pozzola, he's not in communication with any other defendants during this time, right? He's not communicating to people while he's absent from the march. Is that true? That's correct. And so now I want to turn our attention over to the chats, all the telegram messages and other things. So you say that boots on the ground, that was created by the person you flipped, the proud boy called Bertino. Is that true? Yeah. And Bertino who you flipped, added my client Pozzola to that chat. Is that right? And so it's fair to say that Pozzola was not active in any of these chats either. She says, I believe, yeah, I believe so. That's true. And so Mr. Pozzola literally spoke to others about a hotel room and that's it. Objection sustained, form of the question. Pozzola had no direct comms. So he rephrases. 
Pozzola has no direct comms with Tario on January 6th. Does he? No, he doesn't. So then Metcalf pulls open this video, the lost puppy dog video, establishing that this is a 12 minute video or 12 minutes after he enters the building. He ends up at near the same spot, right back where he entered. And at that moment, he is not with Green. So your investigations don't ever show Donahoe directly speaking with my client, does it? Sidebar. Now, the defense attorneys are back at the table. Norm Pattis whispers into Metcalf's ear. Metcalf circles some people on the screen. You see these people up here, Agent Nicole? Do you have any reason to believe that Pozzola, my client, knows any of them? She says, well, some of these people are in the Proud Boys marching group, but otherwise, no. And so my client, Pozzola, didn't signal to any other people in the picture to come into the building. He's not saying, come on in here, guys, I'm in. No. Now I want to show you some other footage. This is uh, some CCTV footage from about 30 minutes earlier. And on this one, we've got Rio, we've got Helion, we've got Giddings, we've got Vey. Pozzola has already left by this point. And so my client wasn't communicating with any of the people in this video either, were they? More footage. Here we see this. Where does this come from, this footage? She says, well, it's about 2.22 p.m. I think we're in the Ohio clock corridor. And do you see my client? What's he doing? Yeah, Pozzola. He's talking on a radio earpiece. Uh, any indication of Pozzola talking to Enrique Tario? No. Any evidence that any defendants communicated on radios? Not me personally, but no, I mean, that's not what I was focusing on. Okay, now I want to go back to 1257. You see this moment where Pozzola runs past Zachary Real. Is it possible that they never even spoke to each other after that? Yeah, it's possible. Do you have any indication inside the building that Pozzola is calling any of the other defendants? Any indication of that? No, not, no, no indication. And in this room, at about 222, he's not near anybody else either, right? Right. And then he goes back to the location where he came in from, and he's still not with any of the other co-defendants, right? And he gives the shield back? Correct. So now, Metcalf wants to talk about Ray Epps. He says, you see this video? Who is that person? That's Ray Epps. And who's that person? That's Ryan Samsel. And we've seen that video many times. Ryan Samsel was the man with the hat, flipped it on backwards. He was in the black, I think, vest with a gray undershirt, the red hat. He flips it backwards. He's right with Ray Epps. Ray Epps whispers in his ear. He says, Epps spoke to Samsel right before Samsel turns around and breaches the barricade. You see that? And you see footage of Epps near Pozzola, right? Yes, I do. And Epps also speaks to Pozzola, doesn't he? And she says, well, Epps' arm goes up and is pointing in the direction near the Capitol because Ray Epps was the guy who said, into the Capitol, into the Capitol. And he's talking with Pozzola, but he didn't get charged with any crimes. That's weird. So throughout your investigation, Agent Nicole, have you investigated anyone who was not a Proud Boy or associated with the Proud Boys? Well, my investigation was focused around January 6th, the leading and planning of what happened with regard to all of these defendants. So do you, Agent, you specifically, do you have any subjects of investigations who are not Proud Boys or associates of the Proud Boys? Well, I can't answer that in a yes or no. I mean, if it's an ongoing investigation, I can't comment about it, so I can't say yes or no. Uh, but Shannon Roush was not a Proud Boy. Yes, he met up with them at the food trucks. But you testified earlier that he was a proud boy. Oh, well, if I did say that, then I was mistaken. He says, thanks. So you were mistaken? Perfect, thanks. Sits down. No further questions. Did you hear that, jury? You hear that? She said she was mistaken. No further questions. A little bit of a mic drop moment. Nice way to end the cross. So now all the defense attorneys are done. We've heard from all of them with that very 
troubling FBI agent, Nicole Miller. And so now we turn our attention over to the prosecution back on redirect. And it looks like we're going to get Kinnearson, Eric Michael, who's going to be doing the redirect. So the prosecutor is now out. He says, all right, FBI agent, you're doing a great job. We love you here. He says, I want to ask you about 1776 and Jeremy Bertino saying that you spoke to the phone on the phone with Bertino close in time to when the first FBI, when the FBI first found it on Tario's phone. Yeah, she says, yeah, the 1776 document was seen in Tario's phone and it was sent to him from Erica. And then there were text messages that went back and forth. She sent it to him. Tario's Googles it on 1-1. Later, he responds to Bertino on J6 mentioning Winter Palace. So they want to put in an exhibit, apparently when Google, uh, when Tario Googles Winter Palace. Sidebar comes up. That word is a keyword in the 1776 returns document. It's a cell bright extraction. They say that the Google search occurred at 12.50.14 a.m. Defense objects. Objection. She's not an expert. She can't talk about any of this stuff. Sustained. Prosecutor asks for a sidebar. Now, Roger says that this is, an, this is about the intriguing but confusing testimony that she gave earlier about Tario having allegedly, quote, created, modified, or accessed the documents. Seems to contradict expert Kate Kane's conclusion that no forensic proof exists of whether Tario actually opened the document. Yeah, because they used that phrase, they used this idea that Enrique Tario was the author or knew about this document to turn Bertino. And then the defense was saying, we can't even know whether he actually even opened the document because it was just emailed to him. So the actual expert witness, Kate Kane, says there is no conclusive proof. If FBI agent Nicole says there is, she's wrong about that as well. So she says, well, I was reviewing Tario's phone. I found the document. It says created, modified, or accessed at 930. And then within a half an hour, he called Nordine. One of the members of the FBI team told Kate Kane about this. All this occurred after Kate Kane sent the email to the case agents. Sorry, this is fast and confusing. I'll try to explain later. Yeah, so it's a lot. Now, Kinnearson is back up doing the redirect, trying to rehabilitate this FBI agent. Now asking her about knowledge and her limited knowledge and access to information about the database of the confidential human sources. Yesterday, we had a great cross-examination from, I believe, Carmen... Hernandez, and we learned that there was a big binder full of confidential human source interview forms that the FBI had cataloged from January 6th, a big binder. And they gave it to Agent Nicole and they said, hey, can you tell me if you recognize any of these people? And she's up there in front of the jury and they're just rummaging through all of these. No, I don't know him. Don't know him. Don't know him. We, we're sitting here going, how many confidential human sources are there for crying out loud? So the prosecutor says, uh, FBI agent, do you have the ability to search a database for confidential human sources? No, we don't. And so the, de the defense made her look very foolish for not knowing anything about confidential human sources, not even caring about them, not even looking for them. It made her look like her investigation was laser focused on only identifying the Proud Boys, because in my opinion, that's the truth. They needed to go find one of these white militia, domestic, homegrown, violent extremist groups. And they found Enrique Tario, who's not even white, to be the leader of one of them. Anyways, so they're trying to rehabilitate her now. You don't have any access to those databases, do you? No. Any reasons? Yeah, it's so we can protect our sources. Well, what about Lizardo, one of your sources who picked up Enrique Tario when he got out of jail? Did Lizardo march with the group from the Washington Monument? No. Was he present at the food trucks? Yeah. And then he went back to his Phoenix Park Hotel. Lizardo is now at the food trucks. And then they go back to questions about Lizardo. They say, has he been a confidential human source prior to J6? She says, well, Lizardo made a report to his handlers sometime before J6. Objection sidebar. We'll come back to that topic. 
prosecutor is now referring to Norm Pattis' questions. Yesterday, she had a difficult time circling the Proud Boys. She circled nine people the first time, 13 people the second time. She reviewed videos time and time again. She made flashcards. She studied them. Audio, podcast. She wanted to learn their voices. She was going crazy. She wanted, I really, really wanted this guy arrested. Kind of obsessed in a weird way. So now they're asking about this. They say, hey, you've identified Zachary Reel's voice a couple times. Are you confident in those identifications? Objection, sidebar. She's not qualified. Judge says, oh, she can say And she answers, yeah, I'm confident. I know Zach's voice. She says that there were about 50 to 100 people in the group. I probably know about 45 to 50 of them. No problems recognizing any of them. There were thousands of people there, right? Or were you investigating all of them? No, I'm not. My focus is on what happened on J6, planning and how that event ended up happening. Well, I wonder if she asked any questions about the sergeant at arms from both houses. I wonder if she investigated Muriel Bowser and asked her why they rejected National Guard. I wonder if there was any conversation with Capitol Hill Chief of Police Stephen Sund when he requested support. Why was he rejected? wonder if any of that happened or not. They just wanted to go single out one particular group, two in this case, the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys, and they've done that. So now the prosecutor says, all right, this video here. There's a female voice in the background. It says, take the Capitol. You hear that? And then there's a male voice that says, Ethan, let's effing do it. And then another woman says, take the Capitol. Do you hear that? Yes, I do. And here's another exhibit. This is from the Ulysses S. Grant Memorial on the Capitol grounds. Objection. That's not the Grant Memorial. Overruled. Can you see who's in this clip, Agent Miller? Yeah, that's Dominic Pozzola. And it looks like they're talking about the breach. What's happening right here? You see Ryan Samsel putting his hand on Ray Epps just moments before Samsel topples the bike rack. Put the video on the screen. Samsel shaking the bike rack before Epps even speaks to him, right? Then he takes off his jacket before to fight before he even speaks to Epps. And so they're breaking down that video. We've watched it many times. I think they're actually accurate. You know, I don't think that whatever Ray Epps said to him started that, but he was certainly there. And I don't know what was said. We would love to know. But I think that sequence is right. So they're just talking about the sequence of this. But but again, Ray Epps was not charged with any crimes. He was literally right there and screaming all the same things that many other people, doing many worse things than many other people who were charged. So they say, now seeing another angle, another video from the government's montage. Can you circle the members of the marching group here? She's circling them. Objection overruled. You can keep circling. No problem. Prosecutor says, now I want to go back to Biggs. There was a megaphone that he had shortly before the breach. Can you circle all these proud boys up there? She's circling away. And they take a break. Judge says, all right, everybody, now's a good time for our afternoon break. We're going to pause right there. Everybody take a break. Uh, Defense attorneys, hang tight. So they are still back in the courtroom. And Smith, one of the defense attorneys, he says, all right, judge, listen, you know, on redirect right now, this prosecutor has elicited new info about call records. You can't get new info on a redirect. It's outside of the scope of the original direct exam. She said that Tario called one minute after he allegedly accessed the documents. It was more than 90 minutes later. So we need our opportunity to do a redirect, right? This new evidence that came out about this call was not true. Also, the other exhibit is data that says that Tario accessed the document. And so we can't allow that in either. Prosecutor says, don't be silly, judge. This all came out on cross-examination. It's not new. All is within the scope of the cross that he elicited, and they had the information from the start. Judge says, should the government call her in their own case? Prosecutor says, well, maybe we can elicit the exact time that elapsed between the document and calling Nordeen. And Jeraguay says, we've been ambushed, judge. 
They just put this person on the stand and she just started dropping this. We've been ambushed. The judge says, all right, you guys better talk this out. And the prosecutor says, judge, why don't you check the transcript? You should check the transcript and you should really see what a witness really said. We think she may have said within an hour and a half, not a minute later. So they're having a debate about what this witness said. And how did he record this? She said Tario called one minute after he allegedly accessed the documents. Okay. So our boy, Roger, he says that she said one minute. They're saying that she may have said an hour and a half, not a minute later. So the judge said, to see it was sandbagging when the government didn't even elicit on direct, it came out on cross. It says, we actually objected when the defendant tried to go down this route. This is not an ambush. So the judge says, all right, well, I got to give the court reporter a break and put a pause on her. Carmen Hernandez says, judge, your honor, I've had my hand up this whole time. <laughs> oh my gosh. So Carmen is sitting there like this. Judge, hey, 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 over here. Hey, unconstitutional. I've had my hand up this whole time. And the judge says, you've been heard many, many times, Carmen. You're not getting called on. Breaking for 10 minutes. She's like, oh, don't you hate that? I know the answer. And they don't call on you. So while on break, he says, here's what happened. At some point, FBI forensic expert Kate Kane emailed the lead FBI agent, including Miller, to write what she saw. She says no forensic proof about Tario at all. And even though there was circumstantial evidence that he did look at it, yeah, it's about this evidence, about whether he actually read the email or not. We'll fast forward through that. So Judge Kelly is now back on the bench. I think we've got a good handle on what's going on here. Judge Kelly is back on the bench and the prosecutor starts the line of questioning again, says, all right, whatever the records say about when Tario called, we're just going to stipulate to it. Okay. We don't need any recross. So we'll just agree. It was an hour and a half, not one minute. We'll just correct the record. We don't need you to go back in and ask a whole nother slew of questions. We'll just adjust what she said. We'll just change her answer. So the judge says, okay, well, that's fine. We're not going to need any recross. We'll just do that. The judge also addresses a piece of evidence that Kennerson tried to introduce earlier. Apparently, one confidential human source, Lazardo, did make some sort of report to his handler before J6. And Kennerson wants to make some use of it. The report itself is hearsay, though, and Judge Kelly wants to keep this out. Says, nope, can't use that. Kennerson thinks it's unfair to let the defense argue later that no CHS has told their handlers that they had concerns about J6 when someone did make a report. But Kelly seems like he's going to keep it out. Tario's lawyer says the information that Miller referred to was a surprise to both camps. He claims the government doesn't know what she's referring to. He then asks that her testimony about 17.6 should be stricken, wants the whole line of questioning gone. Prosecutor says, all right, judge, I've been able to identify the documents and the metadata. It's 925 on J2. We've examined the telephone records. Call was placed 926 from Tario Tornordine. The records say what they say. So if you're going to stipulate whatever the facts say, that's fine. Smith says, we were wrong about the phone records, the minute issue, but we haven't heard from any competent witness that Miller is interpreting that data correctly. We examined the telephone records. Yeah, there it is, right? Been able to identify the document and the metadata. So it is one minute. And then the, the defense says, okay, well, we were wrong about the calls. Sorry about that. The minute issue. But we still haven't heard from any competent witnesses that Miller is even interpreting that data correctly to mean that Tario actually accessed the document. Is this a reason for her to be recrossed? He says, no, stipulation's fine. Parties can agree. Jaraguay says, hold on a minute. We don't agree to that. For the record, Tario is not agreeing to any stipulation saying that Tario accessed the document. We're not agreeing to that at all. Judge says, okay, well, that's not what the stipulation is about. It's about the time of the phone call. All right, bring in the jury. 
that's enough out of that. Jury comes back in and that redirect uh, the of Agent Nicole Miller starts back up again. Here's what it says. Uh, Agent Nicole, I want to go back to Pozzola and his presence with the Proud Boys. Uh, we have this video here. Uh, Pozzola is over here. He's very close with the other Proud Boys. You see that there? Yeah. Is Nordine having any problem balancing in this video? No. Do you see Zachary real in any of these videos doing bad things? Hernandez objects sidebar. Kirsten is now showing other footage, a panorama scene. Do you see what's going on here? She says, we saw Zachary real go next to Johnson. They looked at each other. Their arms touched. Objection overruled. Just going through a bunch of different videos, it looks like. Same videos. So the prosecutor is now showing a video from Zach's phone, showing Pozzola and Green. Carmen Hernandez was trying to make the argument that they were not close to one another. So the defense is just show the prosecution is just showing videos that they are close to one another is basically all it is. Here's another video doing the same thing. Prosecutor says, hey, is Pozzola in possession of a shield at this point in this in this frame here? Is Pozzola in possession of a video of a, of a shield? Yes. Did he offer it to the police at this point? No, he did not. That was later. Go back to another video. Angry Pozzola shows Pozzola angry after returning the shield. He turned around and blew smoke in the direction of the officers. More video footage. Addressing whether Nordine stole a flag. Another video. The woman is near Nordine as she as he steals the flag. Now the prosecutor is trying to show a telegram chat. Objection sidebar. Prosecutor gets it in. Here there is a chat where Pozzola is present in the chat. Remember they're trying to sort of say each one of these defendants is not like the other. Each one of these defendants just doesn't belong here. And they're trying to pull them out. And the government's trying to do the opposite. They're saying, oh, look, Pozzola is here. Here he is. He's talking with all these people. This one is showing Tario being invited to this new chat. They're talking about planning a trip. Here's another parlor post. Showing that they're regrouping and that they're all in these chats again. Objection was sustained. We have further discussion about Tario. Uh, Agent Nicole, did Enrique Tario have contacts? Yeah, other people on the ground. We were looking at the chat to see who these people were. On January 6th, there were 10 messages that were sent. The content was recovered from one of them, except one, which just said this. They're looking at different chats recovered from the phones. One of Tario's messages was out to a skull and bones chat which did include Nordine and Ox. This one says, make no mistake, we did this. That's where the prosecutor left it and a good way to leave it. Here, this message, you see Enrique Tario, looks like Ethan Nordine, nine other people, skull and bones. Hey, noble lead, I thought you should have rushed the police line on the 12th. This could have made, okay, this is so much better. Are we a militia yet, says somebody? Yep, make no mistake, we did this, is what Enrique Florida, proud boy said, right? And now the government is saying, I guess that is we insurrected America, you know, and so that's all they need. He leaves it right there. That's his mic drop moment. And he finishes. The judge says, all right, everybody. Thanks for being here. Okay, jurors, you're excused for the day. Attorneys, we're not done with you yet. So why don't you stick around? So they leave and the judge says, all right, thanks, jurors. Now the judge then, he says, all right, we're done here. I want Agent Miller. Stay available for the case in case we need the defense uh, wants to call you. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're done for the day. We're recessed until 9 a.m. tomorrow. Hope to see you then. And by then, hope to have the screen back in the media room that shows the exhibits. And that, my friends, is the end of the live tweet thread, courtesy of our friend Roger Parloff. And we're extremely grateful to Roger Parloff for these live threads. So... Make sure you're going and supporting him over there on Twitter if you're following him there or checking out Lawfare, the Lawfare blog from our friend Roger Parloff.